So I just listened to the podcast with Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. Very excited to make a response to that. I have had this on the back burner for way too long, so uh, starting that without getting this out, as simple as it is, uh, would be a shame, and there's no way I would do it. So um, uh, very excited to comment on that, and I will give a detailed response. I do have a dog in that fight, and I have a bone to pick with both dogs. Um, that being said, uh, I've been following Jordan Peterson long before the debacle with the powers that be, uh, up there in Canada. Uh, I would, um, certainly would have liked to put this out a lot sooner. Uh, I apologize. I don't know exactly where he is, uh, with that. Hopefully that is for the most part behind him so that he can focus on, teaching where I feel like he's probably most at home and able to contribute the most to the community. Um, whatever the case may be, you got to do what you need to do and uh, fight when you have to fight. Um, basically, what you're going to see after this is a small excerpt from uh, an interview with the late, great Northrop Fry, um, huge uh, person. Um, Canadian uh, literary treasure and um, enormous uh, figure at the University of Toronto. I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert on the history of University of Toronto or Northrop Fry. Uh, his work is of great interest to me, as is Jordan Peterson. Um, and I don't want to lump them in together. I don't know what objections uh, Jordan might have there, but the hardships that they went through, the alienation, the isolation, um, through uh, going through what will be shown in the internet. I don't want to chop it up for baby. The anti-intellectual presence on a campus, how absurd it is, and uh, standing up for that and um, uh, demanding that students be disturbed, uh, uh, think for themselves, not become ideologues. Um, you'll see. Uh, it's coming up right after there. Um, but all the best, Jordan, um, and I uh, look forward to giving a response to that debate. Um, take care, guys. All right. Fry encouraged freedom and self-confidence in his students, but he also insisted on discipline. Freedom, he has always said, is not simply a matter of doing what you want. Freedom is wanting to do what you have to do, and this kind of freedom is always rooted in practiced habit. There is no antithesis between freedom and necessity. If you're playing the piano and exercising your free will about whether you will play the right notes or the wrong notes, you're not playing worth a damn. You only know what you're doing when what you want to do and what you have to do are exactly the same thing. Fry's insistence that true freedom only roots in a ground first cultivated by patient habit did not endear him to the student radicals of the later 60s. Freedom now was their cry. One Maoist pamphlet of the time described Fry as the high priest of clerical obscurantism. These were probably Fry's unhappiest years as a teacher, and sometimes he felt himself quite isolated, but he continued to speak out forcefully. The uh, student activism of the 60s was something I had really very little sympathy with. It started out with a group of students in Berkeley feeling that they were not being paid attention to as students, something I could profoundly sympathize with. Uh, as it went on, they became more and more attracted by the cliches of uh, revolutionary ideology, and uh, then they turned into something which was no longer intellectual. In fact, that was the thing that sickened me about the student movement was that it was an anti-intellectual movement in the one place in society where it had no business being. And uh, once a student gets on a self-righteous kick, he becomes utterly impervious to argument because he's still too young and insecure to uh, listen to anything except the applause of his own conscience. And uh, I knew that that movement would fall dead in a very short time because it had no social roots. It wasn't like feminism or a black emancipation or anything of that sort with a, with a real social cause behind it. 
How was it anti-intellectual? It was anti-intellectual in that it used anarchist and neo-fascist tactics of breaking up meetings, occupying buildings, and that kind of thing. They felt they were doing something when they were doing this kind of nonsense. The element of desperation in this was something I think you could understand, right? The, f- the feeling of unreality in the world um, but, that that was provoking this. Yes, you were sympathetic but, to, but it was a counter unreality that they were they, they were trusting to. And uh, what I find hopeful about the present political situation all across the world is the gradual loss of belief in the validity of of ideology, qua ideology. How did you respond to the demand for relevance, let's say? What did that slogan mean to you? I said that it was a favorite word of Nancy's. Meaning? Meaning that all this stuff was going in a, in a neo-fascist direction. The Nancy's talked about Zweckwissenschaft, about target knowledge, and that came to mean sooner or later that useful meant essentially essential for waging war. And that attitude to the arts and sciences not only destroyed art and science in Germany for a whole generation, but it helped materially in losing the war for them. The demand that the university curriculum be made relevant to the current interests of students, Fry considers antithetical to the true purpose of a university. It is precisely what is irrelevant about what we study, Fry said during the 60s, that is the liberalizing element in it. Universities exist to unsettle our prejudices, not to reinforce them. As a teacher, Fry has lived this commitment to liberal education. But during the course of his career, the university has changed in ways that have made it harder to realize his ideals. It's changed as society has changed. The 19th century university was the very small college, which was the training ground for young gentlemen. That meant that all relations were personal, tutor and student, with their private hours. And uh, as uh, the university has begun to reflect more advanced industrial and technological conditions, and the world has, of course, irremediably pluralistic in both the arts and the sciences. It has to be a world of specialists that can't function otherwise. So you get a great deal of highly specialized scholarship, which makes a problem for the person who still is teaching undergraduates and is still in that personal relationship. And it throws more responsibility on the undergraduate, too. What I'm wondering, really, I guess, is whether the university, as you would like it to be, and as it must be to play the role you see for it in society, whether that university actually exists any longer, except insofar as you continue to do what you do and there must be others like you. The university, as I would like it, is, uh, it does not exist. The only thing you can do is to fight rearguard actions in small corners.